Thanks for coming. So I'm going to talk about uh, transparent snarks from Dark Compiler today. And this is joint work with Alan Chepenyak and uh, Ben Fish. And uh, the, the main problem that zero knowledge proofs solve is, is something that uh, you can see here in a Bitcoin transaction. And the same holds for Ethereum transactions. It's that if I want to check the validity of a Bitcoin transaction, then uh, I need to know the uh, you know, the check for a Bitcoin transaction is that the sum of the inputs is greater or equal than the sum of the outputs. And to do this check, to check that the transaction is valid, I need to know these amounts, right? I need to know how much money is being sent. And, and very similar in Ethereum, I need to check that the person who's sending some money has enough balance in their account to send the money. The, uh, the difference is actually the fees here in Bitcoin. But uh, the problem is, that this is actually really bad for privacy. And um, the, 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 because everything is public. So what this means is if I get my salary in uh, Bitcoin, for example, in Ethereum, then my salary will be public on the blockchain and everybody can see it. And that's not something that I want to have. So for example, also if I'm a supplier, then you know, if I buy some, some uh, if I'm a company, right, and I buy some, supplies for my company, then all of my competitors will exactly see how much I'm paying for these supplies. And that's a, an important business secret. And you know, this, this really leads to this maybe slightly controversial statement, but that Bitcoin in, in the way that it works now, it's really unusable for uh, businesses. And uh, in a similar way for Ethereum, you know, if I run maybe some, some investment fund on Ethereum, right, then, then everybody can see exactly what my investing strategy is, right? My, total, my whole business secret is uh, the whole secret sauce is, is my investment strategy. But if this fund is on Ethereum, then everybody can exactly see if it's on Melon or something, then everybody can exactly see what I'm investing in. They can front run me, you know, it creates all sort of problem. And, and this really means that Ethereum is unusable for, for many financial services. Well, luckily, we, we sort of know how to solve these problems, and uh, that is by using cryptography, and especially something called zero knowledge. And the, the idea is that instead of having you know, a Bitcoin transaction that looks like this, I'm going to hide all of the amounts. So I'm going to use something called a cryptographic commitment to hide all of these amounts so no one can, can see what these amounts are. They're, they're basically encrypted. And uh, the question, though, is then how do I check that the transaction is valid? How do I check that you know, the, the in, sum of inputs is equal to the sum of outputs plus the fees? And uh, similarly, in Ethereum, how do I check that the sender has enough money in their account to send uh, the transaction? And the way to do that is using something called a zero-knowledge proof. And this is really a magical cryptographic tool where Peggy can convince Victor, so the prover can convince a verifier that something is true without giving up any information about why it's true. So for example, I can convince you that you know, I'm committing to a positive number, right? Like the remaining balance that I have is positive. But I reveal no other information, and especially I don't reveal what my balance is, right? All of that remains private. And the way that this works is basically, uh, you know, one, one way to imagine it is through sort of this interactive challenge response protocol where Victor gets to ask questions that Peggy wouldn't know the answer to if this wasn't true, right? She could not answer these questions if the statement wasn't true, if the, trans if the, the balance was negative. But the answers re don't reveal any information whatsoever about what the, um, what the statement is. So uh, what we really need, though, in a blockchain setting is not this, this, this sort of interactive proof. We, we, uh, yeah, and, and in the end, uh, the, uh, Victor has no idea what X is, but it's positive, and Peggy must know it. And uh, what we really need in this interactive setting is, is a NISIC, a non-interactive zero-knowledge proof of knowledge where basically the prover can just write down the proof, and the verifier can read it and check it, and everybody can read it and check it. It's publicly verifiable. And uh, this relies on some common reference string that both the prover and the verifier have access to. And there's many different kinds of zero-knowledge proofs. There's maybe you've heard of snarks, you've heard of starks, you've heard of bulletproofs, and then there's also a bunch of others. 
right? Uh, you know, there's a tremendous development happening in this space, and I'm going to like vastly oversimplify. Uh, ooh, this went wrong. The the orange ones should be green. The orange ones are good. Uh, so the vast oversimplification is that, you know, like looking just at snarks, starks, and bulletproofs, is that snarks and bulletproofs they're good on the proof size, starks not so much. The verification is great for snarks and starks. And you know, snarks are great now, but unfortunately, they have this thing called the trusted setup, where uh, you know someone needs to uh, perform a trusted setup. I'll, I'll talk about the trusted setup and why this is a problem in a second. But basically, there is this party who creates a proving key and a verification key, and if that party cheats, then really bad things are going to happen. And you know, maybe a little bit more more in depth comparison that I don't want you to read, but you know, this is a recent comparison. And basically, there's no snark without trusted setup that doesn't have, or no proof system without trusted setup that has logarithmic proof size or, and logarithmic verification time. And this is exactly what I'm going to present today. The first practical snark with logarithmic proof size and logarithmic verification time. So uh, snarks have this trusted setup. So what is the trusted setup? It means that there's some party, you know, some really nice guy, who uh, creates a proving key and a verification key. And the prover uses the proving key to create the proof, and the verifier uses the verification key to check the proof. But if that party colludes with the prover, if that party cheats, then it can break math. Then it can say that 3 plus 3 is equal to 4, or 7, or whatever. And uh, why is this a problem? Well, if the trusted setup is subverted, the prover can create fake proofs. And what this means is if we have subversion, then I can create money out of thin air. I can have uh, you know, one Zcash coin and create a million out of them, because I can break math. And that's really problematic, because you know, suddenly we have undetectable inflation. The privacy still holds. It's really, really bad. You can alleviate that through a distributed set setup, which is what Zcash did, and they did a really good job with it, and those are like the smartest and the absolute word, ex word expert in, 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 in snarks, and they still messed it up, right? They were, the, the setup was broken, they luckily caught it before something bad happened, or at least we think so, we don't know, um, but you know, the setup was broken. So it's, it's really difficult to get this right. And one other thing that is really annoying is for the most efficient snarks, you, uh, every time you have a new functionality, you need a new setup. So for example, if I want to have one snark per uh, smart contract, then I need to have a new setup every time. And every time that setup can be broken. So um, this is quite, uh, quite problematic. So really, the goal is to remove this need for a trusted setup. And Bulletproofs, for example, does that, but Bulletproofs works for small and medium complexity transactions. But for large complexity transactions, it just takes too long to verify. It doesn't have the succinctness property where proofs are very efficient to verify, even if they're very complex. And snarks have that. So this is why we build dark proofs and supersonic. So how does that work? Well, the main thing that we build is a new polynomial commitment. So what is this? So this is uh, a cryptographic tool where the prover has some polynomial, so you know, 3 plus 2x plus 5x squared, and so on, uh, of degree d. So it has d plus 1 terms. And the prover sends this commitment, which is a small value, even though the polynomial is large. The verifier can send uh, point z. And then the prover can tell you the polynomial evaluated at z is equal to y and give a small proof that this is true. So this is a polynomial commitment. And recently, there was this cool new proof system called Sonic, which is a new kind of snark by, ooh, I dropped the reference there, but uh, Mary Mahler and, and Chambo and others. Um, and it's, it's a snark system that uses a polynomial commitment scheme. And it has a trusted setup still, but the set, trusted setup is only for the polynomial commitment scheme. So nothing else requires a trusted setup. And it's also, it already is universal, so it already removes this problem that you need a new trusted setup per circuit. So it already is great. And it got even improved, uh, you know, the constants got improved by, by new proof systems called Planck and Marlin. But they're, you know, all the same family of proofs. And what we do is we build a new polynomial commitment scheme, uh, which uh, 
uses uh, so-called Diophantine arguments of knowledge, so uh, integers, uh, integer equations, and that's why we call it a dark. And it uses these, these so-called class groups, and it has uh, logarithmic communication time and logarithmic verification time. And most importantly, it doesn't have a trusted setup. So what does this give us? Well, uh, the, 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 uh, we have Sonic, right? And now then we plug in this new dark proofs, and then we get, ooh, this is sort of messed up, but we get, what happened here? I'm gonna fix this. At least for this slide. We're gonna get supersonic, uh, which you know is the first uh, snark with short proofs and no trusted setup. The proof size is about is less than 10 kilobytes. Verification time is less than 100 millibytes, uh, milliseconds. So it's very nice. So how do we build this? Well, we built this something. You know, now it gets. Uh, now we're getting into sort of the technical part, trying to understand how this actually works. So we're, we're building this using something called a polynomial IOP. So what is a polynomial IOP? Well, basically, think of it as if the prover and the verifier have access to some polynomial, maybe in multiple variables uh, uh, in the sky, and then in every round, the prover sends maybe a new polynomial, the verifier sends a challenge, then you get some new polynomials, and so on. So there's some interaction where the prover and the verifier you know, send you some uh, polynomials, and then you send uh, the, the, the verifier sends you some challenges. And these polynomials may be large. But what we can then do, if we have a proof system like this, and Sonic is a proof system like this, then we can use a polynomial commitment scheme to not send the polynomials, but just send the commitments to the polynomials. And it turns out, you know, that I, this is interactive. There's a generic transformation called the fiat Shamir transform to uh, transform this from an interactive proof to a non-interactive proof. So basically, all we need now is, is this thing, and then we can focus on, you know, uh, kind of compiling these things down. So this is the this general recipe of how we can build these snarks. And uh, a lot of different snarks actually fall into this category of polynomial IOPs. So if we build a new polynomial commitment scheme, it helps improve all of these snarks and make them, or all of these proof systems, and make them uh, have no trusted setup. So that's exactly what we did. And Sonic, uh, you know, as I already said, uh, gives you a five-round IOP with 24 uh, oracles. But in general, uh, you know, we can we can make this uh, work. So let's focus on the main construction. So the first thing of of this polynomial commitment scheme, right? So this is what we're trying to do. We've boiled it down to we just have to build this polynomial commitment scheme. So you know, let's recall what a polynomial looks like. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this uh, polynomial and encode it as an integer. So what we do is we pick, simply pick a large Q. So all of these, uh, normally these polynomials are in a field, in a prime order field, ZP. But what we're going to do is we're going to repre represent it over the integers and pick a Q that is larger than each of the coefficients and then just simply evaluate the polynomial at Q. So this might seem a little bit weird. Why, why, why are we doing this? What does this mean? Well, let's think about it very concrete. So our polynomial is 4x cubed plus 2x squared plus x plus 3. And then we take q equals to 10, and we evaluate f hat at 10. Well, what do we get? We get 4, 2, 1, 3. It's literally just the coefficients written next to each other, right? Because 10 is, a, is, a, is a, you know, we're, we're thinking in decimal. So with 10, it looks really nice. But you can do this with any other number. You know, if I had chosen eight or five or whatever, this would have uh, worked as well. Okay, or a hundred. You know. So uh, what we do here is we transform our polynomial into an integer. So why do we do that? Well, this integer encoding has very nice properties. So if this Q is large enough and there's no overflow, then actually this has homomorphic properties, additive properties. So I have a, you know, one polynomial, 4, 2, 3, 1. You know, I, I just give you the integer representation. And another one, 1, 4, 4, 3. And it turns out that if I add these integers, I get the encoding of another polynomial, which is literally the sum of the, the original polynomials, right? So if I add the polynomials and then encode, it's exactly the same as if I encode and then add the integers. 
So this is what we call a homomorphic property. So this is an additive homomorphism. And it turns out there's also a, 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 a multiplicative homomorphism or monomial homomorphism. So if I want to shift the, the polynomial by a degree x to the k, you know, say x squared, then this is simply equivalent to just multiplying it with q to the k. So x squared times h of x is 5x squared plus 6x to the fourth, blah, blah, blah. And you know, this is simply equivalent to just multiplying 100 times the encoding, right? x is 10, or q is 10, 10 squared is 100. So uh, all of this works. So now we've transformed our polynomial to integers. So why, why does this help? Well, there is these cryptographic tools called a group of unknown order, right? These integers are still large. If my polynomial is large, the integer is large. So I cannot send you the integer. That would be, much too large. It would be way too large. But now cryptography comes into play. And we have this thing called a group of unknown order. And all you need to know is that basically this is a commitment to integers, which shrinks down the integer. It doesn't matter how large the integer is. You know, it could be hundreds of uh, millions of digits. It shrinks it down to something that is constant size. But the homomorphic properties, these additive properties, are still preserved. So I can give you a, a commitment to integer 3, and then 1 to 4. And then if I add these things, then I get a commitment to uh, uh, 7. Right? And so what I can do now to commit to my polynomial is I lift it to the integers, I evaluate it at q, and then I compute g to the f of q. So now I have a way, and then I can still do all of these additive operations up to a certain bound. So uh, this is the way that we commit to the polynomial, and this is the main tool that, we'll that we're using. And then, uh, so what are these groups of unknown order? Well, you know, there's, there's different ones, but one that you could use is this class groups, which, you know, in general, cryptography, is, it's important to think about abstractions. So don't go looking up class groups. It's not worth your time, right? Like, just use them as a tool. Um, but there are a group of unknown order. Uh, and so we believe that computing the order is hard. We believe that taking roots is hard. And most importantly, they do not require trusted setup. So I can generate this group. I only need to do it once. And uh, it doesn't have to have a trusted setup. And they're a little bit, you know, compared to, say, elliptic curves, which, by the way, elliptic curves uh, are not an integer commitment because I do know the order. So you know, if I commit to some large integer, I can reduce it mod the so-called order of the group. But uh, the problem is that these groups of unknown order, to be secure, they need to be quite large. But that's unfortunately something that we have to deal with. So how do we build a polynomial commitment? So let's think of this again just you know, in terms of polynomials. So what I want to do is I have a polynomial of degree d, so with deep terms. So it's this large polynomial. And then uh, we're going to use recursion. So to re use recursion, we'll split it up into two parts, a left half and a right half. So fl of x and fr of x, such that fl of x plus x to the d over 2 times fr of x is equal to f of x. The prover then sends fl of x and fr of x to the verifier. The verifier checks that this equation holds, right? checks that f of x is equal to this. Using, again, in the end, this will use the, this, this, these homomorphisms. And then the verifier sends a random challenge. So this is a random alpha. And then the prover combines these two polynomials just using the linear combination, fl plus alpha times f r of x. And this gives us you know, f prime of x. And importantly, now, after these, these, this uh, one step, we now have a polynomial of degree d over 2. So we reduce something from degree d to something to degree over d over 2. And then we can just repeat. Right, and uh, if you do the math in your head, how often do we need to repeat? Well, we need to repeat uh, log two of d times. So, say the polynomial is of degree a million, we need to repeat twenty times. If it's of degree a billion, we need to repeat thirty times. So, uh, of course, we cannot send these polynomials in the clear. So, what we're going to do, we will really send, you know, these these encodings. Right? Again, we will evaluate the polynomial at q, we raise it to the power, and so on and so forth. But um, you know, it's, it's important to think about this interactive thing. But I also want to evaluate the polynomial at a point, right? This doesn't, you know, there's no evaluation here. So what I'm going to give you is, additionally, I'll give you, you know, 
I'll claim that the polynomial evaluated that z mod p is equal to y, and then basically in parallel to sending these things, I always also send you, you know, fl of z in zp and if r of z in zp, and these things are, are constant size. So these things are small, and you can efficiently check, uh, uh, and then again, you can efficiently, you know, check this equation, right? So this would be yl plus z to the d over two is equal to yr. Uh, plus yr times yr is equal to y. So I can check this equation both for the polynomials and for the evaluation very efficiently. And then I com can compute my y prime. In the last round, I compute my y prime, which is equal to f prime of z, uh, which is equal to yl plus alpha times yr. So uh, maybe that was a little bit too fast, but it turns out that basically, you know, I, I, I send you these polynomials, I split them in half, take a random linear combination, and then recurse. And if I want to evaluate this polynomial, I also do this on the evaluation. And then in the final step, I have a polynomial which is just a constant degree, right? It's just a single element. It doesn't have an x term anymore. Uh, and I also have the commitment to the polynomial, and I have the proposed evaluation. So the prover just sends then f0 in the clear, degree 0, and the verifier checks that f0 is a small constant, and that c is equal to g to the f0, um, and that f0 is equal to y, right? Or f0 mod p is actually equal to y, but you know that's a detail. And so what this gives us is uh, a polynomial commitment with two log d group elements in every round, two log d field elements, and uh, we can use lots of batching tricks to make this really efficient. And you know, there's, there's some more tricks that you need to apply to, to make the verifier efficient. So for example, you, know, you need to use some tricks to make sure that, that this check here is efficient, but uh, using some, some recent work in the space of VDFs, we can also do that. And uh, yeah. So um, I am done with the main part of the talk. I think maybe it's, uh, I, I can talk about some optimizations, but maybe you know, there's some questions. And uh, I'll, I think I'll just take the questions now. Thank you. <laughs>